We're filming in San Diego, California, and it's my pleasure to have jazz flautist Holly Hoffman for my guest. My name is Monk Rowe, and um, I'm going to see if I can imagine a little scenario here. You're, you're a classical flute player taking years of classical lessons, and all of a sudden you get turned on to jazz, and your parents go, what, what, what are you doing now? What happened to all those lessons? Is that close at all? Well, it's not close only in that I started jazz first. No kidding. Dad was a jazz guitarist. Okay. So, um, although he, he, you know, he was just, uh, you know, he just did it for fun once the kids started coming along. We played every night after dinner from age five on. Wow. And so, actually, my lessons started at age seven as a support to having learned standards with Dad. I could play the real easy kind of springtime, beautiful springtime, and a lot of um, the simple standards that I could actually get on the instrument because I wasn't, you know, I didn't have too many notes that I could play at that point mm -hmm. at five. And then it was the bottom register that I couldn't, couldn't reach, reach yet. <laughs> so uh, really, um, they thought there was some natural jazz ability there, uh, and that's why they sent me for classical lessons, because my dad didn't feel like I'd have the, the aptitude for jazz if I, if I didn't get the, the instrument accomplished. And, um, and actually, at four, I was playing on a little flutophone, mm -hmm. and that's how the flute thing kind of happened. Yeah. Then I got a flute at five. I think your father had some pretty um, far-reaching thinking, you know, to especially recognize... Especially for that time, yeah. and especially for a little girl. Uh -huh. And, um, well, they both claim that I was bouncing on mother's lap on two and four <laughs> at two, two and a half. So um, that was father's indication That's that... That's important. She knows the backbeat. <laughs> that, that, you know, there was hope there for me to carry on the tradition. Wow. Did you pursue the, did, did you get interested in, in the classical music enough so that it became something you wanted to pursue, or was it always uh, jazz remained the thing? I think pretty much jazz remained the thing. I was not encouraged to play jazz through my, uh, really all my classical education because I was studying with the principal flutist of the Cleveland Orchestra, Maurice Sharp, mm -hmm. and he felt that jazz was a lesser music. Mm. And so, really, he was pretty rigid about it. And then when I went to, I did my undergraduate school at Cleveland Institute of Music and stayed with him for the four years because I had an opportunity at that time to sub for him at the Cleveland Orchestra. Whoa. Um, and that really made me want to go there to school. Um, and at that time, it was really frowned on in terms of getting a conservatory education. Uh, you were not to be out playing gigs and doing anything other than the classical. And uh, frankly, I didn't have much time to pursue it during those years because school took all my attention. Mm -hmm. Is the anything in jazz that you've done as nerve-wracking as playing in a symphony orchestra? And that's personal opinion. No, okay. no, because I never had the chops as a classical flutist that I feel that I'm starting to get as a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. Chops make you, you know, the, the command of the instrument and the idiom make you comfortable. And classical music seems like an endless study of styles and articulations and the proper ornamentation and all the things that you need to pursue for the rest of your life. Just like in jazz, I'll need to pursue, pursue tunes and changes and styles there for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But I was never as natural at it as I am at jazz, at the classical. Yeah. And I, I think in, in jazz, you have the ability to, uh, if there's a mistake, you can make it work in your favor, or at least you can deal with it. If you make yeah. a mistake in an orchestra... Yeah, really bad. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't come in at the right time. And yes, I've done that. Uh, yeah. oh. Not in performance, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you're from... 
where are you from? I didn't have this from, information. From just outside Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And so that was how I, you know, had that association in Cleveland with Maurice Sharp. And uh -huh. he had been the, uh, the uh, principal flutist of the Cleveland Orchestra for 44 years. So. Wow. Some seniority there. Yeah. He was there in the Radzinski days and the George Sell days. Uh -huh. so it, that was quite a, he was quite a, an icon. You know, uh -huh. He was really, he was a big deal to study yeah. with. And very, very strict. He was, you know, one of the last of the, the real taskmasters. Mm -hmm. I see Frank West show up on your um, list of people that you've played with and mm -hmm. studied with. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Uh, that came about through another wonderful jazz musician uh, named Slide Hampton, mm -hmm. who heard me at a Jamie Abersole clinic when I was in college, and uh, we struck up a friendship. And a long, you know, years later, we still get a, a chance to play together upon occasion. And he uh, suggested that I come to New York during the summers and study with Frank a bit, which I did several different summers in, in college, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was a wonderful experience, and Frank, to this day, in fact, we're going to be playing together on the uh, West Coast Jazz Party. Um, now getting to play as a peer with him, although wow. I, you know, I'd never in my mind be a peer of Frank West, but uh -huh. you know, to get to play on the same stage with him, this is a fabulous thing that's happened there. Uh -huh. And he was, uh, he was also a teacher that, that was very strict about certain things and gave me a lot of input and probably some of the best input on the flute I've ever had because there were not a lot of people playing flute when I was a young girl mm -hmm. for me to listen to. Just a very few. And he was one of the only guys. Yeah. There seems to be some, uh, let's say, historical confusion about who actually was the first jazz, uh, or at least flute player to appear on a jazz record. Some say it was Frank. Uh, I've heard Sam Most. I think actually guy. it was Wayman Carver. Okay, that's another yeah. name I've heard. And and really that was the first one. Uh huh. Um, so and then you know shortly after that Sam Most, Joe Farrell, Frank West. Uh, I'm not qu quite sure of the chronology there, but uh, he really gave that bassy thing another yeah. sound to work with and inspired all those cool arrangements and. Oh. Those were the years on the Basie Band. Yeah. Did you uh, have occasion to hear him live a lot of times back then? Uh, not on the Basie Band, no. Yeah, he was, that was post-Basie, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I didn't, but, um, but yes, I've heard him live many times, and um, I, I'm just in awe of what he can do, especially considering that he still doubles to this day. And many of the flute players, including Hubert Laws, uh, uh, well, Moody still doubles. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Herbie Mann. A lot of those guys just don't double anymore mm -hmm. because it's a tremendous embouchure change. And uh, it's been really, uh, he, the fact that he does it so well, it just mm -hmm. amazes me. When I, on the other hand, tried to play saxophone in college because everybody told me that yeah. I would get no gigs being just a flute player. I would have to double so I could play in big bands. And I, and I very seriously studied the saxophone for nine months until one of the conductors one day said, Madam Assistant Principal Flute, I don't know what you're doing with your sound, but stop it. Ooh. Ouch. Did he say this in front of the... In, in, in front of 79 other people. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I probably should stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Did he know what you were doing? No. Okay. But he knew something was going on that was affecting your sound. And I, I guess I kind of knew, but I was kind of hoping that it would just straighten itself out. Gee. Is it the, the fact that your, your bottom lip sits on your teeth and that it just changes your muscle structure? For me, I felt that the saxophone was very, a very tightened uh -huh. embouchure. Um, I had to tighten a lot of muscles around here. And I had learned an embouchure on the flute that was very relaxed. Uh -huh. And I couldn't make the biting kind of change there that, that is necessary for saxophone. Mm -hmm. So Frank is really, Frank and Moody and Buddy Colette and all the guys who still double and do it so well just amaze me. Yeah. 
Well, maybe it makes a difference if you play the saxophone first. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I had been a flute player for a lot of years when I tried. Right. Um, what brought you to San Diego? Uh, friends, actually, not in the music field. Uh, feeling that I needed to live on one of the coasts mm -hmm. for work. And uh, after graduate school, I was living in Denver because I went to University of Northern Colorado for graduate. And um, Denver was definitely not the place. It has a, an emphasis on other kinds of music there. And um, so I felt that New York was a bit much at that point for me. So I, um, I worked in San Diego and Los Angeles area first. And then San Diego just grew on me. and. Uh, this seemed like the right place to be. Uh huh. So it worked out pretty well. I've yeah. It's not a big jazz town, but uh, I travel a lot, and I manage to keep a steady gig going pretty much all the time when I'm here. I've been very fortunate. Uh -huh. And of course, I have the phenomenal rhythm section here of Mike Wofford, Bob Magnuson, and Jim Plank. So mm. I'm uh, I'm really spoiled. Yeah. And when you say you travel. Um, you get thrown in with other people, other rhythm sections. Mm -hmm. And like most of the people we're talking about it, that are here for this jazz party, a big part of, one thing that I think students need to know about being a jazz musician is a big part of it is knowing repertory. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're constantly working on? And Constantly, constantly. I, when, just when I think I know a lot of tunes, I run into somebody who knows double the tunes I know. Mm -hmm. Like Mike Walford is a good example. Uh -huh. There's not a tune you can call it that Mike doesn't know. Oh. So uh, yeah, I'm constantly learning tunes, constantly writing, constantly rearranging old standards that are still great tunes into maybe a little bit different groove or mm -hmm. uh, just a different way of playing the tune, make it fresh. When you're with um, on a, a festival or a party or something, you don't see too many flute players, for one thing. Yeah. What is the role of the flute in a in a throw together ensemble? You know, like when if if you go down and you see a rhythm section and you have a trumpet and a a sax and a trombone, you kind of know who's going to be doing something. If, if they call Lady Be Good, you kind of know where they, and they know. Where, where do you fit in, in in that scenario? It really depends on the tune and the players, I'd have to say, although I'm always kind of on the top. I'd many times be playing the melody yeah. or playing, if there's a melody instrument playing the head, uh, like a saxophone player, I'd maybe be playing little back, uh, background fills. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely not harmony. That usually the trombones and the trumpets and things yeah. do that. So you're almost taking the place of like the clarinet in a Dixieland band. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. You could look at it that way. Well, I try to put the flute into another position, like it's just another horn instead of being a flute, because a lot of people still don't consider the flute necessarily a jazz instrument, or they think that a female is going to play it in some kind of feminine sense instead of a really hard-hitting, mm -hmm. jazz, aggressive jazz style. And while there's a place for that, you know, on a burning tune on a jazz festival, that's not one of them. So uh -huh. I try to really take it out of that flutistic feminine thing and put it into just another horn. And a lot of promoters say, oh, we can't put a flute with all these horns. Well, I said, give me a microphone. I'll be fine. And until they actually hear it, they, they don't see it fitting in a lot of times. Uh -huh always trying to get them to hear it. Do you pretty much promote your own self? Do you have an, do you have an agent? That I, I had an agency until this last year for several years and um, there were some ethical concerns there and I went back to doing my, I let them go and I went back to doing my own booking which is a real hard thing to do especially during the, you know, the summer months when we're all on tour. Uh, mm. But it's actually I think worked out better because I think many of the promoters like to talk to the artists and oh. I can explain what it is that I do and what I need probably better than an agent. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's very hard to find the time to do both. 
So let me rewind a little bit to uh, your childhood again, because I find it fascinating that you were jamming with your father when you were five. <laughs> did did he play out? Did he play gigs and so forth? He he yes he did. Um, for a few years, uh, you know, early on in my life, I can remember him coming home from the chemical plant that he worked in all day and going out on a gig. But then more and more, he he pretty much was just home with the kids. Uh huh. Did you trust his opinions when it came to music then? Oh well, yeah, because I you know I didn't know. I mean, he seemed very he sounded wonderful to me, uh -huh. and I listened to records and uh, and. He pointed out things on the records, and I always understood what he was, you know, telling me. Um, so yes, I thought he was just wonderful. I I had a rude awakening, I guess, later on when I got I went to high school at the Interlochen Arts Academy, and I started to learn some lessons there, and then more lessons as I as I went to college about the role of women, or should I say, the lack of the role of women in jazz at that point. Mm -hmm. because um, Dad felt that if you played well, it didn't matter if you were male or female or black or white or, you know, what instrument you played, you just would get the gig. And I grew up with that in my mind, and then I got to a certain point where I found out that wasn't really the case. Uh -huh. And that was real hard. Yeah. That was probably the hardest thing to, to deal with as a young player because I started to realize that there were all sorts of reasons for getting gigs, and a lot of times very little of it had to do with talent. Uh-huh. Is that still something that you feel affects how much work you get, that you're a woman? It's affecting it less and less, I'm happy to say. Uh-huh. But yes, it does, and um, many times I'm dictated uh, to about rhythm sections, having a certain amount of uh, African American players and white players. Uh, I'm still told many times that flute is not a jazz instrument; it doesn't belong on this or that. And so there's dim there's uh, discrimination in terms of what instrument I'm playing. Sometimes, unfortunately, still there's a there's a group of uh, male promoters that don't feel women swing mm -hmm. or really belong in the jazz idiom. Mm. And that's getting less and less, but it's still there. And then there, uh, there, there is still a, a uh, strong issue in terms of uh, the African American uh, community versus the white community as far as you know who gets the gig in in those circumstances too. There's a group of of uh, of African American listeners who feel that. They support the African American musician simply because they feel it's their music. Right. Where are those kinds of things happening mostly? I mean, I'm not sure that that's a fair question. Um, at, at festivals and so forth. I think less at festivals and more in terms of the individual cities where uh, where people who run jazz festivals uh, are jazz uh, societies where they bring uh -huh. in bands and things. A lot of them seem to be, you know, limited in their thinking. Uh huh. When all kinds of people can play this music, it's yeah. nobody's music, and nobody owns it. And and you know, unfortunately, it's been perpetrated a bit uh, in terms of um, the booking now that's going on with uh, in at Lincoln Center with Wynton Marsalis. It's a very African American music program. Mm -hmm. So that's had its effect, unfortunately, and. Uh, do you think it's a pendulum that will someday slow down and, and stop somewhere that were, where that's fair for everybody? I hope so. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, they tell me that, uh, you know, years ago a lot of the black players didn't get gigs that the white players got. Mm -hmm. You know, conversely, there was like a reverse discrimination going on there. Right. So. That the black big bands had to do a lot more one-nighters as opposed it's, to sitting down at a hotel for a couple yes. It's weeks. funny. It's funny that that issue has to get into the arts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Funny's a 
kind word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. And most of the musicians will tell you that it's all about music. You know, it's the promoters and so forth that, yeah. I guess, change the issue. Yeah. Um, what was, you had mentioned that you listened to records, of course. What were the, who were the people that you were listening to that put you on a path? Mostly big band players, ironically. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad had a lot of big band records. And one of the first lyrical soloists that I heard that I told dad I wanted to play like was Johnny Hodges. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I picked him out, and dad would put on different records, and I would pick him out off every single kind of ballad recording and say, that's, that's how I want my ballads to sound, Dad, you know. Wow. Um, Dizzy Gillespie once told me that I, um, that I played like a trumpet player. Oh. And he suspected that I grew up listening to uh, bebop trumpet players and trumpet players from big bands, swing band trumpet players, because uh -huh. my style was nothing like saxophone and nothing like any other flute. So, uh, and I really did listen to a lot of trumpet players because the primary soloists in the bands at that point were trumpet and sax. Yeah. A little less with trombone, but still some. Hmm. And who were the first, of course, Frank West, any other early jazz flute players affect you? Uh, the flute players, not so much. Uh-huh. Uh, people gave me a lot of Paul Horn and Herbie Mann and, you know, my parents' friends gave me just, you know, a wealth of, of LPs and things. But um, they were never playing the flute like I heard the flute. Hmm. And uh, th I mean no disrespect by that. I just heard something different. I heard, I guess, the flute being a horn. And in those days, they were always playing the flute in that, you know, the doublers would play a real burning saxophone solo and then pick up and only use the flute in a really pretty mm -hmm. kind of fluffy setting and I didn't hear it that way. Right. So. so save the records and give me some clothes or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I guess you know I, list, I started listening to the masters because then I started being guided by people who had a, a lot of knowledge of jazz even more so than my dad had and I I listened to Charlie Parker and I listened to John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk, Duke mm -hmm. Ellington, Billy Strayhorn, um, you know, and started to really cultivate that music yeah. in my education. Think of some of the most memorable gigs along the way. You've mentioned Dizzy. Yeah. Did you get to play with Dizzy? I got to play at a session with Dizzy, yes, in New uh -huh. York. Yeah. When was that? Oh gosh, that was uh, when I was actually in New York studying with Frank, and uh -huh. Slide Hampton uh, was nice enough to take me to a, uh, a session after hours on Bleecker Street, and uh, at that time they were uh, finishing a rehearsal. The United Nations Band, or what later became the United Nations Band, was finishing a rehearsal, and I got to play with Dizzy. And then again at Moody's wedding out here, Dizzy was the best man. And uh, Mike Wofford and I played the wedding music. Oh. And of all things, we had to perform Con Alma, which is one of Dizzy's, uh, shall we say, h harder charts to play. Yes. And I was, I was sitting at that wedding thinking, oh my God, I've got to play Con Alma in front of Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> <laughs> I was a nervous wreck. But he was just such a sweetheart. Uh huh. Well, we were talking about James Moody before I think the cameras were rolling, too. And he is quite a personality. Oh, very supportive. Very supportive. Yeah. And and Moody's word of mouth has gotten me a lot of gigs. Yeah. And uh, you know he's he's been very supportive, very helpful. And uh, as I was mentioning, you know he often calls me up and and plays a lick over the phone for me. You know, like not so much a lick, but a pattern, some uh -huh. interesting pattern with lots of complicated intervals. And <laughs> he sang a few for us oh, on camera. Oh, oh I bet he, he did. Going, Here, how about this one? Yeah. Doing do, 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 <laughs> do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. That's he, uh, I shouldn't be talking about him, but he did say that he, he mostly learned by ear. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later on that he 
applied chordal knowledge to what he was already doing. Um, does that apply at all to what, how you learned, or were you learning the theory of improvising along the way? No, my dad didn't know that. He was an ear player. Mm -hmm. He knew the chord changes to the tunes, but he didn't understand the traditional theory approach to it. He couldn't have taught that to me. Mm -hmm. He could tell me what notes were in the chord, but he didn't know how to label it. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't learn that until I was in, uh, in high school at, uh, well, I had basic theory, um, theory class as a young child. But um, really it wasn't until I got into high school in Interlochen that I started learning how you spell chord changes and what they're called. Yeah. So I played by ear for a long time. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I, I don't teach a whole lot because I'm, I'm on the road too much and I don't teach children because I believe they need a regular regimen. Uh -huh. But I do have several adult students and some college students here I'm teaching for credit. And uh, I take a totally different approach to teaching jazz from many of the other uh, jazz teachers and that is I teach them by ear and I teach them the theory of it so they can go back and correct what their ear doesn't take them through. Oh. And that's really what I kind of had to go back and do. Um, Slide was one of the main musicians who pointed out how well I played, but that I was missing maybe a change or two in every tune mm -hmm. that my ear didn't take me through, and this was as a young person. Then I would go back and say, why am I missing that, and what am I hearing that's not really there, and what is that chord change? And then that made it a more technical study. Mm. Isn't it helpful to get those kind of suggestions along the way, oh, you know. Yeah. Mentors. That, that he was praising you, and then he was also saying, and now. And very few people will do that for you. Yeah. Mostly what people want to do for you is say, gee, you, you sound wonderful. Mm -hmm. Pat you on the head and say, you know, you'll be great someday, <laughs> yeah. and just send you on your way. The guys that take the time to, to make the suggestion without discouraging you as a young mm -hmm. player are really the important guys. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to get involved in any of the, there's some uh, women in jazz efforts mm -hmm. around the country. Have you been involved in those things? Uh, not too much. I prefer to play with musicians that I choose for musical reasons. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I am playing on Billy Taylor's uh, Mary Lou Williams Jazz Festival at Kennedy Center in May. Mm -hmm. And they did ask me, in, in this case, to bring a female band. So um, I'm taking some wonderful female musicians. Uh, it's such a good festival that I made the exception there because I think it's promoting women in the right way. Uh -huh. And I think it's all about the serious women jazz artists. But uh, I do try to stay away from that as much as I can. I, I, I do play with some female players, but um, they would be because I choose them not necessarily because I want to put a whole band together of right. women. Because they're good at what they do. Yeah. 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 Um, Marion McPartland, I think, has been involved in some of those things. Yes. Have you ever gotten to meet her? And yes, we worked together. Um, as a matter of fact, we put on a women's seminar for young women at the IAJE um, uh, conference last year in Chicago. And it was uh, the professional women doing a seminar and concert for the young women, uh, the students, both high school and college that were there. Uh -huh. So Mary and I and I played on that concert for them and talked to them and did a little mini clinic. And, uh, she was wonderful. She moved so slowly to the to the piano. I was worried that maybe she was not feeling well or or feeling tired or whatever. When she sat down, she just. Yeah. Blew everyone away. Mm -hmm. You have pretty wide ranging um, tastes in music, I think, by listening to your CDs. Mm -hmm. There's still some classical elements you throw in there. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure I have this. Maybe I should just start over on this one. I wanted to play uh, the very beginning of this one tune because I thought it was pretty neat. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Actually, Hubert Laws sound like he listens to you. <laughs> oh, don't tell him that. <laughs> you have a great lower register, too. <laughs> now, was this fairly spontaneous? This. So this is all improvised. This is all improvised. Well, you know, fugal music, classical fugal music, is very similar to jazz. Mm. I mean, it's one when one has a figured bass, one can improvise over yeah. a figured bass. Yeah. And actually, the way Bill Cunliffe and I have started our long when we started our long musical association, and in fact, we're recording another album in May together. Uh, I heard Bill when I was in the years when I was booking the Horton Grand here in San Diego. I heard Bill throw in a classical fugal section in the middle of a jazz tune one night when he wasn't even playing for me, it was with the Clayton brothers. Oh. And I, I went, oh, oh, there is somebody else that does it. <laughs> and I, I went running over the piano and I said, Bill, would you like to come down and play with me? And he said, well, sure. <laughs> it was just, I was so excited and it has become such a wonderful musical association. Mm -hmm. The duo, we, you know, we've, uh, in our reviews, they always say it's like glue. We, there's just it's just seamless because we both are classically trained we both feel the same kind of interplay between classical and jazz at times and um, there's just something there I think because of all that background that's similar mm -hmm. um, and a touch of new age in one of your records too well I I think there's a place for that. Uh, uh -huh. I think a well-written New Age tune, unfortunately not much of the New Age material is well-written musically, and mm -hmm. I think that that taints New Age. In fact, so many people were horrified, as you probably read in the liner notes, that I said I actually put a New Age tune on my new mm -hmm. CD with Bill. But uh, it's a well-written composition, uh -huh. first and foremost. Yeah. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted everyone to see that that, that, that is possible and I wanted to have something with synth on it, synthesizer, and a little bit of percussion, uh, just for something different for the mm -hmm. listeners. This, the new age and um, some of the fusion music seems to abandon hip chord changes. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's too bad. That's really a good way of putting it. Why does it have to abandon them? I, I mean, don't know. Joe Zavino wrote plenty of great stuff oh. that it doesn't have to. There are yeah. there are good writers in that idiom. Uh, there's some great sting tunes. Yeah. You know, pop music doesn't have to abandon, uh, in, you know, chordal integrity. But but then on the other hand, there is certainly a market for mindless music. You know, uh, there's a market for background music where one doesn't have to or even want to listen to any kind of infrastructure or, you know, um, involvement there. Mm -hmm. They want it really to be a groove or a melody that doesn't give them any kind of, uh, you know, uh, they, don't ha they don't feel they have to be listening. It's, it's there. It's easy to ignore. There's a huge market for that. Yeah. Do you think technology in, um, especially with synthesizers and, and drum machines and the way music is recorded has any effect on that? I think that's all about dollars and cents, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've become a nation, even in our arts, of uh, the money-making process preceding the art form. And so... Drum machines are cheaper than a drummer. Yeah. I think there's a danger, too, like with composers, if you have a, a gorgeous reverb-drenched sound on a keyboard and you hit it and it sounds so luscious by itself that you're tempted not to go anywhere with it, yeah. that you end up just writing yeah. this thing. And yeah, there's a lot of that out there. Yeah. Well... Can you recall one of the worst gigs you ever played? Oh, gee. No one's ever asked me that in an interview. <laughs> I should have had you thinking about uh, it because I think we tend to not want to think it, of those. 
it'd be a toss up uh, between a an actual, it wasn't an actual gig, I was being brought in to sit in with players in New York City my first year in New York by slide who decided to involve me in a cutting session. Mm -hmm. That was my worst performing nightmare. My worst gig was when uh, I, <laughs> a rhythm section stopped playing in the middle of one of my tunes in Australia. Uh, no, it was New Zealand. Sorry. I had, um, I had a student rhythm section, all music students, and, and they were supposed to be you know, pretty good, and we had a rehearsal that afternoon, and they were very intimidated by playing with an American artist, and they, their nerves just got the best of them, and they just fell apart in the middle of the tune and just stopped. <laughs> And you know, there's not, there's just no way to. So I turned around and looked at them, and I said, "Well, that wasn't the ending we were planning, folks." But there you go. There you go, and we're going to go on to the next two now. And I just, I had a, I had a feeling in my chest that was just, get me through this. Game. Was this a concert situation? This was a, this was a very big concert situation. This oh. was many, many people. In the wow. So it'd be a toss-up. The cutting session was a nightmare of its on its own. <laughs> well, uh, well, if you don't mind, tell me about that because I've often wondered what that would be. I've never been in, I think, a real cutting session like that. Was it the tunes they called? It the, was the tunes the and the tempos. The tunes and the tempos. It was. Uh, it was a very famous group in New York City. Um, who were quite appalled that Slide brought this little flute player in to sit in with them. And they just decided that they were going to see if I could play. Thank God my dad had given me a list of cutting session tunes, mm -hmm. like Cherokee and, you know, the, the ones that they really, you know, do it to you on. Um, and they called Cherokee, and it was, you know, it's, it's one, one, one. <laughs> it's so fast that they can't play it, but it doesn't uh -huh. matter because that's, you know, they want to see if you spot. can play it, yeah. right. And then um, the saxophone player, who shall remain nameless, came over and said, well, honey, do you think you can play Just Friends? And I said, yes, I can. He said, okay, B major, one, two, one, two, Get three, four. Out. Yes. He did that? Yeah. And Slide went over and said, guys, you know, don't do this because it's making you look bad. And um, Slide just said, you'll stand, I wanted to get off the stage, and he said, you'll stand there and you'll play because this is the tradition. This is what's been done. This is what Diz did to Miles. This is what, this is what has been done to people over the years as long as jazz has been an art form. Uh -huh. So he said, just go with it and do it and do the best you can. And I did okay. And, you know, just Friends in B major is a real trip. But, uh, you know, thank God I was playing by ear. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Thank uh, God you had started when you were five with your father yeah. <laughs> doing that. Gosh. And they just kept calling tunes at that tempo. Cherokee, um, Hot House. Um, it just didn't stop for the rest of the set. Wow. And this was in a club atmosphere? Well, I guess those two would tie right in there for the worst musical <laughs> experiences. <laughs> What's worse, uh, just friends in B major or a, or a rhythm section stopping in the middle of a tune? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you continue to play when that happened for a while, hoping that maybe they just were, would find where they were? I, I kind of just did a cadenza. Uh-huh and realized that they were, by the looks on their faces, they were not going to come back in. And just kind of ended the tune, and then, and the audience was very amused. I mean, they knew <laughs> what had happened, and they, they were very sweet. Wow. Very nice. I, I had very little wherewithal to gather my wits about me to start the next tune. I was just, yeah. I was just. Wow. Well, well the hazards of, uh, <laughs> going to unknown <laughs> venues, I guess, and you said you've played in Australia. New and Zealand, and New, New Zealand, Zealand is a wonderful country and wonderful people, and they love jazz, and uh -huh. they can't wait to get your CDs, and you know, they, it, there's really a wonderful audience there. Uh, and the jazz societies are very active, but um, 
these were younger players that that needed a little more work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were they were they um, mortified afterwards? I think they were. Yeah, they yeah. were pretty upset. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Have you invested in a in a major? Um, flute over these years? Do you, you play a, a, you know, very expensive instrument? Well, I, I have a Haynes that was designed for me by Maurice Sharp. Mm. That's now a collector's item, and I feel a little uncomfortable taking it on the road. And yeah. so for the road, I use a Pearl, which is a mm -hmm. lesser expensive. It's actually a kind of a mid-range model flute, and I have a head joint on it that was made for me by a head joint designer in Australia who made it for me while I was there. Wow. And so it, it adds just that little extra oomph to a standard model pearl flute that mm -hmm. I need. Yeah. That's pretty much what I play, and I love that head joint because it cuts through the rhythm section. Wow. And I don't really have to play highly amplified. Uh -huh. which I, I like to keep the flute in its natural. I've worked yeah. a long time on that sound, uh -huh. and I don't want it to sound amplified. That's or true. You could be at the mercy of, of some sound man that way uh, much and more. And you're always at the mercy of sound men. Uh -huh. Thank God I have a good one here in San Diego. Yeah. Do you ever get really aggravated at, at people on gigs? Yes. <laughs> because sound men very often are, are not jazz sound men. And mm -hmm. They don't really understand that jazz is not a highly amplified music. Mm -hmm. And they want a lot of reverb on the flute. Uh, yes. Reverb and flute seem to be you know, a, a thing for them. Uh -huh. And I keep saying one number of reverb, and pretty soon I'm in the wow, 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 wow. wow. You're in the Taj Mahal. Well, well, is there anything I haven't asked you that I should? Boy, I think you've covered <laughs> so many topics. There's an art to interviewing. You know, you've covered it. Um, where's your next trip? Uh, my next trip is to the state of Washington for the Semiamu uh, Jazz Festival, it, you, Jazz Party. It used to be, um, it, it kind of was a descendant of the Ottercrest, the famous Ottercrest Jazz Party that went on for years and years. Mm -hmm. And that's the first week of March. Uh -huh. When I look at the, uh, some of these festivals, I notice the, unfortunately the audience seems to be uh, over, 55 and white, mm -hmm. and um, hoping that would change, but I don't know if it will. I think jazz parties, that is the case. That seems to be the demographic that has the, the, the money and the interest in going to the jazz parties. The festivals I see are starting to change. Mm -hmm. Younger people are getting involved in the festivals. Uh, there certainly is a wide range of uh, ethnic groups and, um, and age groups now, more and more. And, and of course, jazz festivals have had to incorporate some of the younger musicians and also the younger, the, uh, the more contemporary so-called jazz artists to draw that element in, but I don't know that it's such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Jazz is presented, um, s there's a lot of styles of jazz presented. For sure. And things that are called jazz that aren't really, but. Yeah. Uh, somehow getting the young, you know, we all look at that. Uh, my band looks at that a lot of times at our audience. And we're very fortunate because we have a lot of young listeners here in San Diego that come to the Sheraton to hear us play. And we're thrilled about that because the music has to be passed down. Uh -huh. I sometimes wonder if I'm going to have enough audience when I'm Moody's age, you know? When yeah. I'm in my 70s, I want somebody to still listen to the music. Yeah. How does that happen? I've heard, uh, am I correct in hearing that, that uh, California has very little music in the schools anymore? I think there's a lot of states that don't have a lot uh -huh. of music. Um, California doesn't have much. Yeah. Um, I think there are, though, in every state, and as I go to a place like IJ, IAJE's uh, convention, I realize there are the individuals and the programs that still have bands programs that the kids are learning so much in, and responding to. And I think it's just a matter of those individuals that keep those programs going, keeping them going, trying to expand them uh, until arts becomes, uh, the arts become in again. You know, uh, 
Uh, San Diego is not a very, you know, we, we have lost our symphony for, yeah. for some time. Uh, there is word that we'll be going back, they'll be going back, you know, to work here soon. But um, Southern California needs to, to work harder at supporting their arts, for sure. Do you ever get calls to do any classical yeah. work anymore? I still get to play as a sub with quite a number of chamber groups. Uh -huh. So that's good. It keeps my hand in. I get yeah. very nervous about it because I have to remember that I'm playing the articulation on Mozart and not, you know, Stravinsky. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not in my... That's not in my brain anymore That's after right. college. Don't <laughs> don't swing this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's got to be a, a different mindset, and I've I found it to to be the most um, nerve wracking to play. Well, I my last experience playing saxophone in an orchestra just was a piece where there was t five minutes of rest at a time, mm -hmm. which was the really hard part, yeah. I think. Just concentrating yeah. so much on uh, counting, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I started to write in cues for myself at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, like trumpets enter at bar, you know, 104 right. with this line, and because it's very nerve wracking to count uh -huh. and have to make an entrance, a, a uh, you know, an entrance all by yourself. <laughs> yeah, and hope yeah. the conductor knows knows where you are too. <laughs> Um, do you write um, music at, at, at a keyboard, or do you...? I don't own a piano, so generally speaking, I write it with my flute, I run the changes, and then I sit at a keyboard at some point when I'm starting to get it put together hmm. and play the changes to make sure that's what I want. Oh, so you, you play the changes on your flute, mm -hmm. up and down, mm -hmm. and you can hear if, if that's in the ballpark of what you want. In the ballpark, and then it takes me actually doing it at the piano yeah. to make sure that I'm right, and I'm, you know, sometimes don't have quite the right voicing or the right change. Right. But I at least have an idea of what uh, gender of chord I want there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, I've been looking at keyboards and things. I just hate the sound of them, mm -hmm. the little portable keyboards. Right, right. I probably need to get one of those. Well, this has been a pleasure to talk to you. I, um, I, I know you've done a little promoting around the area and that, that you're pretty well known in the San Diego area. And you yeah. think you'll be doing any more that uh, you can promote your, your festival here or the one you're involved in mm -hmm. at any rate. You have something coming up in uh, Irvine. Mm -hmm. So every year at the Labor Day weekend and the roster just came out in the press today. So. Uh uh, yeah, it's a wonderful jazz party. It's one of the only mainstream jazz parties. Don't they do one at the same time in Los Angeles, the classic jazz Yes, that's thing. a traditional right. like, trad jazz right. festival. And there's also a wonderful fe uh, festival at Vail at the same time. Uh -huh. That's more of an educational effort. Nick Brignola. Yeah, wonderful. Very I good. know Nick. He lives yeah. just a couple hours from us. Really? And he said to say hello to you, oh, as a matter of fact. Now, I, that's right. I remember now. I told great. him we were coming out here. Great. Yeah. yeah. Didn't he, I think he said that he may be playing with you. Maybe that's what he was mm -hmm. referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what a fun guy to play with. <laughs> flute, and everybody says, flute and Barry. Oh. <laughs> you know, and just like when Slide and I used to perform together, flute and trombone. Oh, you know. Uh-huh. What's that going to sound like? It sounds wonderful. <laughs> You know, it's opposite ends of the tonal spectrum. Yeah. Well, I wish you a lot of luck. Um, I hope no one calls any tunes in the key of B. <laughs> Me too. For you, unless it's you. <laughs> yeah. That makes it for a great story, though, see? Yeah. Now well. that you've had a chance to tell it on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you were thinking uh, that at the it'll time. It'll go down in Someday the archives I'll of my life. <laughs> Someday survived. I'll need that story. Yeah, well, at least no one threw a symbol across the floor at you. I think that's what the famous scene from the the Charlie Parker, you know, that oh. someone threw a symbol. Oh, yes. You know, because yeah. he wasn't cutting it. Yeah. Well, well listen, best of luck to you in, uh, Thanks, in your Nick. travels. And it's been fun talking to you. All right. Thanks so much.